You ever hear of a little game called Cave Story? Unlike every other reviewer on the internet, I've never played it or anything by Daisuke Amaya, otherwise known as Pixel until this video. Hero Blaster I would describe as probably the best first video game for people. It's when you are given the control of Mega Man, the weapon arsenal of Contra, and the level and graphic design of Commodore 64 games. The game lets you play a frog, who is pretty much a janitor for a company that produces and maintains teleporters called Cat and Frog Company. The frog must go through seven levels, cleaning up the teleporters by destroying these things called Negativitus Legatia, which essentially translates to negative past from Latin. There's a lot of symbolism toward them and with the president, and certainly there's some discussion as to what they mean or why they affect the president and no one else. Personally, I feel like there's too little to draw a conclusion from, and I didn't draw anything from my playthrough. To me, these things were just pests. The dialogue is also only limited to two characters, this pink dude and a cat man. Their interactions are somewhat humorous with how cat man is always snarky and straightforward and pink dude is more bombastic and over the top. Amusing chemistry, if anything else. If it sounds like I'm skimming through the story, you're right. Kira Blaster doesn't have a very impressive story or very memorable characters, which is strange considering one of the things Cave Story is known for is its wide variety of characters and its deep and emotional story. And really, the story and the characters are the biggest weaknesses for the game. But, and this is a very nice and sexy but, the gameplay more than makes up for it. Now, you start out with this wonky pea shooter, but it can be easily be upgraded to a rapid fire laser gun, but oh no! That next upgrade is 500 coins, meaning you probably aren't going to upgrade it for a good while. Which is fine, as this gun will get you to the stage just fine. And the pea shooter will also do the stage on its own, as long as you're careful. But if you want some extra insurance, you can upgrade your health for one more heart. Any decision you make is viable, and you can use it to get to the stage. The game is balanced so that no matter what you pick, you can beat the game with it. It all depends on your skill. So, what we're going to do with the review is go through each level and dissect it. Otherwise, this review is going to be real short. So in order to stretch out for the maximum of revenue, I'm going to talk about each of the levels. The first two levels aren't really anything special. They're here to teach you how the game works and how the gold system works. The second level is a bit harder with the birds that dive bomb you, so you either gotta tank them or invest in the level 2 wave gun that will wipe out the birds. The boss is even easier than the first one. It just sends out these one-eyed trolls before it comes out of the mud, and the wave gun makes short work of them. Plus, you get the bubbles. Oh god, not the bubbles! What's cool about this game is that dying is a slap on the wrist. You don't lose anything other than a life, and you're put at the start of the room. And if you get a game over, you're put at the start of the stage, but all the puzzles and mini-bosses are defeated. Meaning you can grab even more money on the way back to get better gear to tackle the boss. This is genius! It doesn't scare off newer players or people who aren't great at video games in general. I'm also not bogging down experienced players. I wouldn't call this game hard at all. The only hard parts are the bosses. They're the ones I lost my lives to. Specifically, the big fish dude from the Stage 3. Speaking of, Stage 3 is fine, and it is one of my favorite levels. And for some reason, it reminds me of the hotel part of The Last of Us. This is when mini-bosses are introduced. Most of the mini-bosses are not hard. In fact, I just unloaded the wave bean on him until he died. After that, it becomes swimming around and avoiding fish and mines. Then came the boss. I have an idea on how to tackle these bosses without dying, it's just I end up dying to them anyway. But I have no idea how to take on this fish. In fact, I think it's the only boss that would force you to upgrade unless you knew this game inside or out. If the area was a bit bigger or he wasn't so big, then maybe it would have been A-OK. -okay. Anyways, you get the jetpack for beating him. One of my favorite bits was when you use the jetpack, the color turns from orange and green to show, hey, I'm out of juice. It's real cute. It's real cool. Stage 4 starts out in an industrial area where lasers fight at you if you get in their line of sight. Then it becomes a laboratory where you learn to appreciate that jetpack. I did, but there is one issue. If you're holding right and use the jetpack, it won't propel you in the air, just farther right, making some jumps harder to get to. I got into the habit of jumping and propelling myself in the jetpack to get across white gaps. The boss is something else. It's a goddamn military truck that fires missiles at you constantly. The missiles make a beeline for you, but you are able to dodge them and even jump on them without getting hurt. I'm not a fan of how the truck can instantly kill you by running you over, but I suppose that's the price you pay for getting too close to a truck. Level 5. Oh my. I don't know what it is, but snow looks so damn good in video games. Maybe it's because I've only seen snow 8 times in my life, but I always love to see snow. A more recent comparison would be Press Garden Zone Act 2, where it's a beautiful winter wonderland. 
This is also a level where you get to try out the flamethrower. It melts ice, of course, but it also destroys projectiles, meaning it's a great defense. But enemies will go through the fire and flames to hit you, resulting in a personal fury of the store, but my spirit will go on to defeat them so I can achieve this game. This level packs great music, it's my second favorite track of the game. It's so calm and mixed in with a few great set pieces. It's really atmospheric and it feels good to go through it all. I think it's important that 2D games pack atmosphere, it kind of makes them stand out more. Sixth level is... oh my. The implications are terrifying, and I don't want to think about what this shit is, though I think I might have answered my own question. It's once again a water level, though there are a lot more enemies you have to worry about. It's more hectic and compact than like hotel level, though nothing that you won't be able to get past. The boss of the first half of the level is a cute little middle pod. Aw, oh, he's so derpy! The second half is a subway level, which is interesting. I was always fascinated with the concept of subways and always wanted to go on one, and whenever I found one in the game, I would get really happy to see it. Eventually, you fight the greatest boss in video game history. A pigeon controlling a clock on legs with a tie. This boss is annoying. He'll shoot projectiles at you while Shadow Heartless will fall from the ceiling. The bubbles are your best friend. Final level. It starts as an approach to the office where every monster has gathered to give you shit until you finally reach the office building. And this is probably one of my favorite tracks not only in the game but in Final Dungeons. Though I will talk about the music in greater detail later. And while this level does reuse many of the enemies and hell, a few of the level designs and gimmicks, I still think this level is great. And if I'm being honest, this isn't the hardest level in the game. If you've been upgrading your weapons, then it should be a smooth ride. But then we reach the roof, and this is where all the difficulty has been hiding. You fight the president in three phases as she gradually loses body mass and becomes more nimble. It's the case that the boss gets easier as it beat it, but you have to hold on onto all your health. And then there's the final boss, the source of all the negativitous Legadia, the monolith from 2001. This boss is the closest to a bullet hell shooter, and it's oddly binary code themed. Watch out for the projectiles he shoots and stay off the ground, and eventually the boss will go down. Congratulations, you have beaten Kiro Blaster and have proven the strength of our culture. Now you might be thinking, wow, that was a short adventure. I don't think I got my money's worth. Hold on a second. You might find what you're looking for with, get ready for this, Zongi mode. It's not only a new hard mode to the game, but it remixes all of the levels. And Zongi mode is quite hard. I have not beaten it yet. I can't even get past the second stage. The same rules still apply to Kira Blaster. It's just you have to bring your A game. So let's talk about the rest of the game. The graphics are honestly pretty okay. It looks like a computer game released during the late 80s, and while it looks nice, the style doesn't approach fantastic. And I'll be honest, some of the character designs, especially the main frog dude, aren't that inspiring, with only the president have anything close to a complex design. The enemies are also fairly simple, but they all look really good. Nothing too outstanding, but there are a lot of cute and cool designs for enemies. And the bosses, okay. This is where they devote all their time to. A lot of the bosses are really memorable. They have beautiful pixel art. Of course, all of them look cool. And this game does run at 60 FPS. Never noticed any slowdown, so that's nice. While I do like the pixel art and the graphics, Kira Blaster really isn't the most impressive retro-style indie game I've ever played. But I will say that the game packs some really good atmosphere, especially in the snow level and the final area. There are parts paired with music that make the game feel very melancholic, which is not a very common feeling that games try to emulate. Now music on the other hand, it definitely feels like old school game music that's been modernized. A few of the songs are quite good and nice to listen to. A few near the end of the game are especially haunting. My favorite track is, of course, the office level. For being a slow and foreboding piece as you proceed through the building to get to the top, I really enjoyed the music. Now, I can't go completely bombastic over it, but it's enjoyable. I can't identify what specific genre it fits into, but every track fits the game, and it's great. I'm glad Metro music isn't just used for rocking tracks. I love me some rock and metal, but I also love some slower pieces, you know, some jazz or some ambience. Kind of mixes things up from the last few games. Carry Blaster is a really enjoyable game that I could easily recommend to anyone interested in platformers and shooters. There's a main campaign which can give you a good three hours of fun that is easily replayable, and the Zongyu mode that gives you another four hours of game time. Ten dollars? Uh, that's kind of pushing it. I would say if you're cautious about picking this game up, I'd recommend waiting for a sale. But if you want a cheaper alternative, the iOS port is six dollars. I would play the iOS port, but I've heard it's actually pretty good. Links to the game are in the description. And with that, that concludes my review of Kira Blaster.